All right, well, I've got 11.03, um, and particularly because we um, are really going to do our best to limit this to an hour, I am going to dive in. So welcome, everyone, to our first uh, new online climate spotlight series, where we're featuring some of Maine's most innovative thinkers, businesses, and conservationists with an aim to help Maine people understand how climate change impacts Maine, as well as information to take action. My name is Eliza Donahue. I am Director of Advocacy at Maine Audubon and like I said before, I'm so pleased to um, have so many people joining us today. We are moving towards um, 100 participants right now and I know even more uh, registered so um, I'm sure folks will be dropping in throughout the hour. So we'll be hosting um, these free discussions every other Tuesday between now and late September on topics such as community and rooftop solar, natural climate solutions, transportation and home energy efficiency. Um, you can register at mainaudubon.org energy and also get a little bit more information about uh, the topics that we'll be covering in the future. So why are we hosting this series right now? Well, uh, in 2019, the state of Maine committed to among the most ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction targets in the nation. The law that set those reduction targets in place also created the Maine Climate Council, made up of business people, lawmakers, municipal officials, tribal representative, representatives, and other stakeholders, and tasked them with creating a plan for how to reduce our emissions, as well as prepare Maine for adapting to climate change. That updated plan is due in early winter, and climate policy, um, and now its natural overlap with economic recovery and equity concerns is front and center in the mind of Maine people and major decision makers. In this series, our aim is to give you the information to take action on climate in our, your own home and business and day-to-day -day life, as well as inform you on how to engage um, in creating a strong, actionable Maine Climate Action Plan. So we're really excited to kick off uh, our kickoff event this morning, featuring two of Maine's top climate scientists, Dr. Sean Burkle and Stacey Knapp. Um, we're calling this event the State of Maine's Climate, and we'll hear about what Sean and Stacy know about how Maine's climate has been changing uh, over the past decades and what we've done to address it so far. Dr. Sean Burkle is the Maine State Climatologist uh, and a research assistant professor at the University of Maine. He received his PhD in Earth Sciences from um, University of Maine, and his research focuses on climate and ice sheet modeling, environmental change, paleoclimatology, and data visualization. Since early 2012, he has been building uh, the Climate Reanalyzer, a website that provides access to climate and weather models and historical station data. Stacy Knapp is a Missions Inventory Section Manager in the Air Bureau of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Her team assists with the implementation of systems utilized in the collection, tabulation, and dissemination of air emissions inventory data for the Maine Air Emissions Inventory Reporting System. Sean will give his presentation first, followed by Stacy, and we'll wrap up uh, hopefully by about 11.45 or so to take questions. Um, and I know that Stacy plans, and I'm so thankful for this, Stacy, um, that she'll uh, also end with a few notes on how to engage with the work of the Maine Climate Council. So um, before we get started, just a couple quick tech notes. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that participants are all muted with their video off. Uh, again, each presenter will share their screen for their presentation um, and you can type questions in the Q&A box um, found at the bottom of your screen and we, uh, Nick Lund and I from Maine Audubon will collect them um, and dole out some questions at the end. So big thanks again to Sean and Stacy, and let's get started. Well, thank you, Eliza. And good morning, everyone. It's I'm happy to be here. I wish I could be in person. I really do miss giving 
in-person presentations, but um, those will return eventually. And uh, I'm going to switch my screen over to the slideshow. Bear with me. Oh, Eliza, I see that um, I'm unable to share my screen right now. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Sorry about that. Let me uh, go see if that's something Nick can yep, address. I'm, I'm fixing now. Um, try now, Sean. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, I assume everyone can see my slides now. Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, um, again, good afternoon. And as Eliza said in the introduction, I'm um, the Maine State Climatologist and I'm based at the University of Maine as a research assistant professor. And so what I'd like to do today is give you an overview of climate change in Maine, climate impacts. And uh, I'd also like to note that I have been serving on the scientific and technical subcommittee of the Maine Climate Council. And I was lead of the, uh, the climate subsection of that. And this presentation today is an adaptation of a presentation that I gave in June to a, a full meeting of the Climate Council. And um, towards the end of the, of the talk, I would like to show a, a couple slides of Maine's Climate Future 2020, which is a document that um, we produce here at University of Maine in cooperation with, uh, between Climate Change Institute, Maine uh, Sea Grant, and also the Skudik Institute. And a lot of helpful information, and perhaps many of you have seen that document. And I'd also like to just very briefly show you um, some of the tools available on Climate Reanalyzer and also the Maine Climate Office website that I've been developing for about a year now. So now moving on, uh, presentation outline. And I see I, I may have erred in this. I meant to, I'm going to set a full screen because I think you probably see the slides on the left and uh, You'd think by now I would have mastered Zoom, but sometimes I still goof. Yeah, Sean, either the view or the slideshow should work. Okay. Okay, this should be better. There we go, now you should see full screen. Okay, um, so I, I'd like to go over Maine's historical temperature record, that is since the late 1800s, and also discuss projections for um, how the climate is expected to warm over the next century. Uh, discuss the, the significance of changing season lengths and how that uh, impacts many sectors of the economy and also the in environment and um, um, both plant response, animal response. Precipitation and drought, of course, most recently we've experienced what uh, is sometimes referred to as a flash drought. That's a short-term drought that emerges uh, somewhat unexpectedly. Although in some parts of the state, conditions have really um, alleviated some, especially in Western Maine. Um, and I'll try to put a, a, that into climate context. And that leads into extreme weather. We've been experiencing extreme weather, particularly over the last 15 or 20 years. Extreme weather being increased uh, frequency of both heat waves and cold waves, and also extreme precipitation events, which of course leads into the, the previous section. And then I'll show you a couple slides on changes in snow and hydrology, how the snow season is changing and how that's impacting uh, stream flow and also groundwater supplies. Okay, this figure here shows Maine's statewide mean annual 
temperature since 1895. And it shows that on a linear trend, there's been a three degree Fahrenheit warming. And you can also see that there is some structure to this. There's what we would call interannual variability. That's year to year fluctuations, but also uh, multi-decade changes. For example, the early 1900s, you can see that there were uh, three very cold years in there. And then it got warm in the 1930s into the 1950s. Then a relatively moderate period for a few decades, right up until about the late 1990s or so. And then things started to get really warm. And so the, uh, of course, we've been experiencing many, uh, a unique climate in the history of Maine since the late 1990s. That's both um, in terms of the summer climate, winter climate, and many of the changes that we have uh, seen has really emerged in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And I'll, I'll also speak to the uh, variability on multi-decade timescales. That, that is important because it, it's um, something that we need to consider in, in these future projections, which I show here in this slide. Overall, over the next century, how much Maine warms, of course, will depend on, uh, on global decisions, on socioeconomic decisions in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and um, how the international community cooperates. But this slide here shows using the, the latest generation or the, the available models that, have, that project climate into the future for Maine, we show three particular scenarios, ranging from the low emission scenario in which um, there's a, a, a dedicated uh, dedication to um, halt greenhouse gas emissions and eventually reduce them to, to zero. And then the a high emission scenario, um, which we'd call RCP 8.5. That's one that in some cases it's considered as a business as usual, but it's actually taken more of as an extreme case where there's heavy coal use and no, um, no real international effort to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions. And um, we don't know which scenario will play out in the future. I mean, we can guess and um, as it turns out, all said, the world seems to be trending towards something a little less than RCP 8.5. For one, there's been um, uh, a, a push towards cleaner energy sources and the assumptions of high coal use into the future may not pan out. So that would be, that would be good. But there's still a spread of physically plausible outcomes between now and the next century. And it's up to us and um, in this country, in our state as well, because we have, of course can do things right at home to contribute to how we shape the future. Uh, but there's a spread of physically plausible outcomes and ranging from a climate warming that is not, not too much more than what we have already experienced, ranging to something that's much more extreme would be very impactful. Now, uh, getting back to the decade variability that I had mentioned in the first slide, I, I, I like to show this because many people have questions about, well, isn't the climate warming because there are cycles? And uh, there is variability in the climate system and uh, climate scientists understand uh, very well what factors are involved. Um, perhaps the most significant in terms of natural variability arises from major volcanic eruptions, such as Mount Pinatubo that erupted in 1991 and early in the 1900s as well. Uh, but this figure here shows a comparison of observations of global temperature in the heavy set black in comparison to model, uh, an ensemble of models that project into the future. But in this, in this case, this is the historical overlap interval in which the models are compared to see how well they do. And what we find is that in simulations in which the, the climate models um, have greenhouse gases and uh, human impact held constant, that's what we see in blue. And uh, you can see that the signal departs uh, that in the, in the recent climate it would be cooler than observations if greenhouse gas emissions had not been increasing. Now, alternatively, in the red line, we see the simulation in which greenhouse gases increase in accord to um, uh, 
the historical record over the past century. And I like to highlight that the, the emergence of when it really appeared to become apparent or measurable that, that the, the greenhouse gas warming and impact that started in the 1800s with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, that the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the manifestation of a changing climate appears to have emerged from the, sig from the noise of natural variability sometime between about 1930 and 1950. And then since then, there's been a, a significant departure. And um, it's always important to have a historical perspective and also to validate models of projection to the future, validate them against observations and, and data. And that's one of the uh, reasons why I showed that slide. Now, in terms of the changing climate and changes in the future, one of the major impacts in Maine and elsewhere is how the climate warming, which is somewhat abstract, when we look at a time series of um, say 50 years from now, it might be three degrees warmer. Well, what does that mean? And how does that impact ecosystems and um, uh, forest migration? And also how does it impact agriculture? We can think of that in terms of how the seasons change in terms of their length. And so this figure here shows the temperature annual cycle for three periods. In blue is a, a period that's for uh, the interval between 1895 and 1914. And uh, the brown indicates the, the climate of 1995 to 2014. And then in red is a, is a projected climate for roughly centered on 2050 from a projective model. And you can see that with each step, there's been an increase of the length of the warm season, which also translates to an increase of the, of the growing season and a reduction of the winter season. And so over the past century, uh, Maine's climate has changed such that the growing season is now about two weeks longer than it was a century ago. And it's projected to be likely another two weeks longer by about 2050. And again, depending upon the emissions uh, choices that, that we make and the climate realization that emerges uh, from uh, what the emissions are in the future. Precipitation. One thing that has been uh, readily apparent over the past couple decades is a, uh, a shift towards more intense extreme rainfall, which I'll talk more about in a moment, but the historical record of annual precipitation has also increased over the past century. And uh, in particular, since the mid 2000s or so, there was a, a wet interval that has had a, is a significant feature in, in this curve. But over the past century, there's been a six inch increase in total annual accumulation. Uh, but this figure in itself, it does not speak to the delivery in terms of what season of the year and whether or not the precipitation is being uh, evenly distributed or coming in more intense events. And um, I will mention that much of the precipitation increase that we've experienced in the last 15 years or so has been occurring in the summertime. And that's despite the, uh, the drought of uh, 2016 into 2017. And then this most recent, so far uh, temporary um, abnormal dryness to what is now ranked a moderate drought. Extreme weather. Uh, as, I've, as I mentioned, extreme weather is becoming more common and that's um, in, in many places, if not most places across the Northern Hemisphere. And it's due to changes in atmospheric circulation. Uh, imagine or picture a uh, jet stream that you might see in a nightly news forecast. The jet stream, which is a current of fast flowing air in the lower stratosphere, that has a linkage to the track of storms uh, lower down near the surface and um, certain patterns can can get locked into place for several days or even a few weeks or a season and these blocking patterns are part of what causes extreme weather to develop whether it's a cold wave or heat wave or even extreme precipitation because when there's a, a strong blocking pattern when that pattern finally breaks down the very steep contrast that develops between warm and cold on the other side of the wave, that can fuel an intense storm. 
Uh, and so one thing that we've noticed has been an increase in, yeah, in terms of extreme precipitation, about 50%, 55% increase in annual heavy daily precipitation across both Maine and the US Northeast. And in Maine, uh, we found that there's been an increase in occurrence of um, high precipitation events of different ranks. So two inch per day, three inch and, and four inch. Now I mentioned jet stream and here's a, um, a what, I, what we would call a temperature anomaly map. That's the departure of temperature from uh, baseline climatology, and here it's 1979 to 2000. That's the shaded background map. And then a schematic of the jet stream overprinted. And I say schematic, but this is the, the general track of the jet stream for this particular day. This was Thursday, um, October 31st, 2019, uh, which was the lead up to a major windstorm on November 1st, which many of us may remember. But there is a strong blocking pattern that had developed and I had mentioned the, the contrasting temperatures on either side of, of a, a particular feature. And so part of the intense windstorm that we experienced it links back to this blocking pattern. And you may recall, I know it's been several months ago, um, but at the time, California was experiencing uh, severe wildfires and are being fanned by what are called the Santa Ana winds. Well, those winds were being fanned by this pattern as well, this blocking pattern that was driving circulation and driving intense dry winds off the continent, uh, for, well, from the interior of the continent in, into California. And so it's interesting that there's an extreme event on the West Coast, same time as extreme event on the East Coast, and they're linked by this circulation pattern. Um, I remember this very clearly, summer in March 2012. I think this is a textbook example of an extreme event. This was a heat wave in the third week in March, which temperatures got into the low 80s across the state. Northern Maine, uh, most places got into the mid to high 70s, but central Maine, southern Maine, saw so temperatures as high as 83. Um, I think in Bangor, we got to 84. And um, this picture is several years old now for my, my son. Uh, March 18th, and no snow on the ground, which was just, for me, it was a pretty new experience because I remember as a kid growing up in the Bangor area, um, March was always the snowiest month, pretty much late February, right into mid-March. Mid and well, this event occurred because of a major blocking pattern that developed and heat and humidity built over the uh, eastern half of North America. You can see this it's depicting a blocking high pressure. And, um, and that, when that pattern finally broke, well, then uh, temperatures went, started to dip below normal. But this was record setting. Um, the first 80 degree measurements in most places in New England by three to four weeks in terms of, um, um, and there were records in Maine set by 17 degrees. Daily high temperature records beaten by 17 degrees Fahrenheit. Typically a high temperature record is beaten by a half a degree or one or two degrees. And so this was truly an extreme event. And it's uh, what we would expect in a warming climate in which the summers are getting longer and the winters are getting shorter. It means that summer-like circulation can happen earlier in the, in the year. Likewise, it can persist later in the year. And um, I'll just give one more example of that I don't have a slide for, it, but uh, the warmest fall in record in Maine was 2017. And it was an example of the summer season extending into the fall. Now, likewise, there are impacts, uh, major environmental impacts, including um, earlier snow melt. And um, so this slide here shows that there's been a, a documented trend towards earlier winter spring melt runoff, so melting snow, by seven to 14 days. And that's since 1950. And these trends are projected to continue as the climate warms. Now, there, there can still be some years that seem to, to buck the trend. And, and recently, just in the past uh, four years or so, there have been uh, uh, near record setting snowfall in the northern part of Maine. Um, uh, Caribou, I think uh, two winters ago, there was a, a record snowfall. And even this season, uh, the snowfall was well above normal. I think it was probably the second or third snowiest uh, 
winter that persisted well into spring in northern Maine. So there are exceptions and uh, if we were to look at uh, the statewide distribution of some of these records, uh, we find some interesting patterns. Ice out on Maine lakes is occurring earlier. earlier. I think we've all experienced this and um, again it follows the changing length of the seasons. Um, lakes are now tending to ice out anywhere from uh, one week to even close to two weeks earlier and um, this is projected to um, continue as the climate warms again in association with the changing length of the seasons. And likewise, there's been an increased magnitude and frequency of small floods. And um, uh, the stats here show the relative increases over the past 50 and 75 years. And some of these floods can come from extreme precipitation events or a um, freshet that happens early and really fast because of a, of a, a jump in temperatures. But when, they, when these events do happen, they're extremely impactful and can, they can cause a lot of damage. And the 100 year three day peak flow, so that, so that, that would be the, the spring freshet. Those um, are projected to, to decrease. And again, with linkage to decreasing late winter snowpack. Now, the, some of the complexities could be that uh, some years, there, as we've seen, particularly in Northern Maine, there may there could still be some record setting um, uh, years in terms of snowfall that affect say one part of the state or it, it may, we, it won't be that every single year the, these peak flows decrease, but over time we, we do expect that this trend will continue. But it's always important to be aware of some of the um, exceptions that could emerge. I list a summary here with um, a lot of bullets, and I, I don't think that, um, I'm not going to read through each one. Uh, you can um, take a look in terms of how the statewide annual temperature has changed, about three degrees Fahrenheit over the last century. And models predict anywhere from two to 10 degrees warming over the next century. Again, it depends on the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions. There's been changes in annual precipitation, overall increase for the past century of about six inches. And, uh, but, there's more complexity when we look at how that's distributed seasonally and also whether or not it's, be, it's coming in um, uh, throughout the year or in more extreme precipitation events separated by periods of dryness. Um, extreme weather such as heat waves, droughts, uh, heat waves, cold waves, small scale droughts, and also um, um, storms, wind storms. Those are things that we've been experiencing and expect to continue and um, systems are responding to these changes, responding to the, the warming in terms of how it impacts the, the um, uh, temperature annual cycle, the length of winter, the length of summer. And um, so looking into the future, there are significant changes likely ahead. And again, it'll be up to us here locally on the decisions that we make and how we contribute to the overall landscape of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then of course, something, many things are out of our control, which in, in terms of international agreements and how the inter international community proceeds. And now very briefly, being mindful of time here, I just wanted to show you a couple, uh, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna switch my screen here to a web browser just so I can show you the main climate office website. And also climate reanalyzer. Okay, here we go. Okay, the main climate office website, I have been uh, building this as part of what I do as a state climatologist to provide a, um, a place where people can have easy access to Maine based climate data. And the website address is mco.umaine.edu. And on this, you can access daily data. And for example, here on this page, it shows station data from the Bangor International Airport. And you can select the year. The Bangor record goes back to 1953. And uh, let's go to 2012. Here is the 
the 2012 heat wave in March, for example. Uh, you can export the data that you see here as a CSV file that you can open up in spreadsheet software. You can select from uh, these stations that are here on the map. So say if you wanted to see data for Portland, that comes up. Uh, there's also, I've put together, oh, selected the wrong one, monthly seasonal and annual temperature and precipitation, time series and maps, and uh, also by climate division across the state. So we can look at the Northern Climate Division, Central and Coastal or statewide average. And you can choose from the temperature anomaly, it's departure from, um, in this case, I use a, a 1901 to 2000, 100 year long climatology. Um, average monthly temperature, maximum temperature, minimum, also precipitation. And I've added just recently, just in the last couple of weeks, a page for Gulf of Maine temperatures. And I've also included bioregions uh, right along the coast. I haven't added a map to delineate those yet, but I will soon. You can also look at a um, North Atlantic wide average of sea source temperature. You can pick on a point in the chart and that will bring up a map of either sea surface temperature or the anomaly, the departure from normal. And then there are other resources on the page, um, hourly weather forecasts, maps, and climate outlook maps from NOAA and the Climate Prediction Center, including drought information and temperature outlooks for uh, the coming week, month, and season and also a list of publications. And one publication I'll mention is at the top here, Maine's Climate Future 2020, which uh, we released this in early March this year. And if you haven't had the opportunity to look through this document, I, I, I recommend it. There's a lot of information um, summarized, uh, I, I think in a, a pretty comprehensive manner, uh, an update to our understanding of climate change in Maine. And a lot of this information has or, or much of this information has been delivered to the Maine Climate Council. And uh, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee has assembled a report that will soon be made public. And so um, that will also be a, a, a resource that I, I think that you will find quite valuable. And then the last thing, I just wanna mention Climate Reanalyzer website where you can access global data sets uh, from um, both station data, climate models, weather forecast models. And in the interest of time, I don't want to uh, belabor this, but I'll go to the site index where you can get an idea of the content on the website. And this is climatereanalyzer.org. And I thank you very much for your time and I look forward to answering questions. And now I'll turn this over to Stacy. Oh, Stacy, you're on mute, just so you know. And actually, before you begin, I just want to say very quickly, first of all, thank you, Sean. Second of all, uh, speaking of extreme climate events or extreme weather events, there's a huge storm over my house right now. Um, <laughs> I don't know what happens if we lose power here, but to the folks watching at home, please um, just check your, uh, your inboxes. We will uh, get back to you as soon as we can uh, with new information um, if that were happening. It's 2020, so I assume that the worst is is going to happen, but we're good so far. And uh, Stacy, um, thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay. So, what do you see right now? I see the start of your slideshow. Progress okay. toward greenhouse gas reduction. Excellent. Goals. And you just see a slide, a single slide. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. Cool. Um, get this out of the way. So first, thank you, Nick and Eliza, for having me. Um, I was really excited to be invited to present. Um, we in my group um, work with emissions data all day, every day, and it's it's 
rarely of interest to a lot of people. <laughs> um, and so we've been really excited since the release of our latest report that so many people have had some interest. So um, I am Stacey Knapp, as Eliza said, I head up the emissions inventory section at Maine DEP. And as you probably already know, in January, we released our eighth biennial report on progress toward greenhouse gas reduction goals. And um, so this is a biennial report, comes out once every two years. So the next one will come out in January of 2022. Um, but this last one released in January 2020 has received a lot of attention and we are just thrilled that so many people are interested in our data. Um, so my plan for today is to walk you through some of the results that we presented in the eighth biennial report and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end. Now before I get started, um, because you may not have read the eighth and the seventh and the sixth and the fifth biennial reports, um, I just want to remind you that where we were before the latest report, at the, when we released the seventh biennial report, we had actually seen a slight uptick in emissions. And so we were very nervous um, about where we were um, in regards to meeting our 2020 goal and then the more lofty goals that were just set into legislation. Um, so I am very pleased to report that advance here, that with two more years of data added to this series that we now have a decrease in emissions again, which is hugely exciting. So what you're looking at here are our gross emissions. That is the blue line at the top. So you'll see two lines. There's the dark blue line at the top. Those are our gross emissions. And that is everything. Okay, that's all greenhouse gas emissions. That's carbon dioxide, that's methane, that's nitrous oxide, that's our SF6, HFCs, the works. The green line just below is the CO2 from burning fossil fuel. So that is just CO2. And as you can see, that is the lion's share of our emissions, right? So CO2 from burning fossil fuel accounts for 90% of our gross emissions. And then that remaining 10 is the additional greenhouse gases. Um, so what you see here, this is a time series from 1990 to 2017. Now in 1990, our gross greenhouse gas emissions were at 21.2, and these are in million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. And the CO2 equivalents just means that it's all of the greenhouse gases and not just CO2. Um, you'll see that those gross emissions, they rose until about 2002. So we see an increase from 1990 to 2002. And then we see this nice steady decline. Um, and here's this little uptick that I was telling you about in the last report that we were nervous about. But now we see a decline again, which is great. So we are now, as of 2017, at 17.5 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Now, um, conveniently, and I, I triple checked this because this was too convenient, um, that is exactly 17.5% lower than the 1990 levels. Now, you may remember that our goal for 2020 is to be 10% below the 1990 levels. So we needed to be at 191 in 2000, and we are currently at 17.5. So we are on track to meeting our 2020 goal. Um, now we do have a few more years. I know that for you and I, it is 2020 today, um, but the, the data do lag a little bit. So it takes some time to accumulate that data and to do the analysis. Um, so we have a couple more years before we know if we have met our 2020 goal, but I am optimistic, which is great. All right, so let us talk about these goals a little bit before we go any further. Um, many of you have probably seen this, but um, the solid line here over on the left, that is what we know, right? That is the, the data that we do have. So that is the 1990 to 2017 data. And you can see um, this peak up here in 20, uh, excuse me, 2002, and then this nice steady decline through 2017. Um, so our 2010 goal was to simply be at the 1990 level. So that's this dot right here. And we successfully met that goal, which is great. Um, now, our next goal is the 2020 goal, and that is to be 10% below the 1990 level. And we are on track to meeting that, which is wonderful news. Now, the next couple of goals, the 2030 goal is to be 45% below 1990 levels. And the 2050 goal is to be 80% below 1990 levels. And if you follow this green trend line here that kind of slopes down, that is sort of a best fit between our, um, the 2002 data and the 2017. So if we follow this line and we can realize the declines we have seen since 2002, then we are on track. Um, but it's going to take a lot of work to realize those emission reductions. So we've got our work cut out for us, which is why we have the Climate Council. So let me back up a little bit and talk to you a little bit about where we get this data, like how we track our greenhouse gas data. Um, so at DEP, 
we use EPA's state inventory tool, which we call the SIT. Now, this is a publicly available tool, so anybody can go out to the website, and I've listed it here on EPA's website, and download this tool. Um, it's an Excel tool. It's got a series of modules, and within each module, there are gosh, like 50 tabs. So it's a, it's a very involved model. Um, but the beauty of that is that it is populated with default data from government databases, from federal data, um, but it allows a lot of tweaking for states. So we can go in there and try to make sure that that data is as accurate as possible and really reflects the emissions that we see in Maine. So the foundational data set for the SIT comes from the Energy Admin Information Administration, or EIA, and they receive lots of reports um, on fuel data. And that is, as we saw, CO2 from burning fossil fuel is 90% of our emissions, right? So that fuel data is enormously important. So they pull all of that fuel data into a giant database and they run a model and it produces what's called the SEDS. It's a state energy data system. And so that is this massive database of the consumption data. It's fuel consumption data. And that is a, a national standard, and it's, it's by state and by sector. It's broken down, the different types of fuels. So the EPA pulls all of that SEDS data into the SIT, along with a number of other data sources, and they create models of our emissions by state, by sector, um, by fuel. So then states can go in, download this tool, and tweak that data. So for Maine, we have some data that we know that the federal government doesn't necessarily have, and we believe that our data is better in some of these areas. For example, we submit specific vehicle miles traveled for Maine. We update the solid waste landfill. We go through and edit some of the industrial processes. So if we don't have the production of some material, um, we go through and remove that industry from Maine because it doesn't exist in this state. So we are able to really hone this tool and make it very Maine specific, which is why we are so confident in the data. Now, you're going to see data presented in this, in the report, in two different ways, two different units. So you're going to see million metric tons of CO2, and this is just CO2, primarily from fossil fuel combustion. And this is presented in the SIT by sector by residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, and electric utility. So that's where you see the breakdown in those sectors. That is for CO2 only. But again, that's 90% of our emissions, right? You'll also see things reported in million metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Now, when you see that little E at the end, when you see the equivalents, that means that we're talking about all greenhouse gases, not just CO2, but we're adding in the methane, the nitrous oxide, the HFCs, the PFCs, the SF6, all of the greenhouse gases. So that is reported by um, source category. So that's where we get our energy and our agriculture, our waste and our industrial process category. So you'll see they're reported a little bit differently. I'll point that out as we go, but I just wanted you to have a little bit of a background. So let's jump into the data. So first we will look at gross emissions for 2017 by source category. Real quick, you can see there's a winner here, right? So energy, energy makes up 90% of where our emissions come from. It's our demand for and consumption of energy. It's the clear majority of Maine's greenhouse gas emissions. Now, industrial processes, agriculture, and waste, all added up, contribute about 10%. Now, that's 10% that we need to look into for sure, but you can see energy is a bigger piece of this pie, so it might get a bit more of attention. So let's take this big blue piece of the pie and break it down a bit further. So here you can see Maine's energy consumption over the whole time series, not just 2017. This is from 1990 to 2017. Um, and this is gonna be by fuel source, right? So you see all the different fuel sources over on the right-hand side. Now, the biggie at the bottom is petroleum. So in 2017, petroleum products accounted for 49% of all of the energy consumed and 84% of the CO2 emissions. So that's why there's so much focus on petroleum products, it's because it's the lion's share of our CO2 emissions. Um, now, the good news is we have seen a reduction. So you can see in this blue segment, if you just look from 1990 to 2017, you can see the 2017 point is lower, right? So we have seen a reduction in petroleum products. And the big piece of this is actually our residual fuel oil. So that's the really dirty fuel oil. Um, and that consumption has decreased 95% since 1990. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but that is a huge piece and that is a massive success. So we're really proud of that. So that has been a big driver in the overall decline of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I do want to point out while Maine does rely 
pretty heavily on petroleum products at this point to meet our energy demands, we have seen significant reductions in CO2 emissions due to things like switching to lower carbon fuels. So switching to natural gas, right? You can see on this figure, this green segment here that pops up right around 1999, 2000, that's natural gas. So we've seen a huge increase in the use of natural gas and that is a lower carbon fuel. So it's going to emit a bit less than residual fuel oil. Um, we've also seen decreased emissions due to increased energy efficiency, so things like the CAFE standards for vehicles. Um, and we've also seen an increase in renewable resources for energy, so that is amazing. Um, now, you can also see in this figure our renewable resources, as I just mentioned. So see this turquoise segment at the top over on the right? That's wind. The point being, you can actually see it, right? You can see that there's a turquoise segment now, which is awesome. And that turquoise segment is getting bigger. So that is wind, just one of the many renewable resources that we've been focused on using more of for our energy. Okay, so let us take this blue piece right down at the bottom here and break that up a little bit more. And let's look at petroleum consumption by fuel type. So you can see exactly what types of petroleum we're using, because you can kind of guess at what we're using them for, right? So um, the two biggies at the bottom here, Again, this is the time series, so 1990 to 2017. Um, distillate fuel and motor gasoline, those are the biggies. But I also wanna point out this orange section at the top. So this is the residual fuel oil I was talking about. And you can see how we have a 95% reduction in the use of residual fuel oil. And that is a huge success. Now, some of that is switching over to natural gas. Some of that is switching over to renewables. Okay. So let us move um, from fuel type to sector. So let's look at petroleum consumption by sector. At quick glance, you can see, again, there's a winner here, right? Right at the top is transportation. Transportation has been in the lead since 1990 all the way to 2017. Um, and unfortunately, they are also the only sector that has seen an increase in petroleum consumption. All of the other sectors have seen a decrease, not necessarily a huge one, um, but they have seen a decrease, but not transportation. transportation is up. So let's switch gears a little bit and look at CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion by sector. Again, transportation is in the lead here. Um, you can see this large purple segment, that's transportation. And transportation has produced over half, so 54% of the CO2 emissions in Maine in 2017. So that's a big chunk. Now, I also want to focus your attention a little bit on residential. The residential section is at 19%. So that's a big piece of the pie. That's definitely something that we need to be looking at. Um, I know when I go to emissions inventory conferences, I'm always, um, frankly, a little embarrassed um, because we go and they're like, gosh, why do you guys have so many emissions from the residential sector? And it is because we use fuel oil. So the national average consumption of fuel oil for residential is only about 8%, and in Maine, it's over 50%. So we use a lot more fuel oil in the state of Maine than other states do. So just an area that we need to look at. Obviously, our infrastructure is set up so that that is very convenient, but we do have natural gas coming in. We do have a lot of wood-burning homes. So there are other sources of energy, and we just need to kind of look at that mix and see how we might do it a little bit better. All right, so now look at, let's look at the same data. This is the 2017 data. Let's look at the same data over time. I think, there we go. Um, and you can see, is this the right one? Yes, this is the right one. Um, you can see transportation in the lead as well, right? So these are the emissions um, we just talked about in 2017, transportation made up 54% of the CO2 emissions. Well, you can see that they made up the majority of the emissions dating all the way back to 1990 as well, right there at the tippity top. And again, all of the other sectors have seen a reduction um, by one strategy or another. Um, since 1990, there's been a reduction in their CO2 emissions, um, but transportation has gone up. So even um, residential has gone down. You can see they scrape by just by 0.3% reduction, but hey, it's a start. Um, commercial is down 24%, industrial is down 58%, and electric utilities, I wanna point out. So take a look at that turquoise line, right? Electric utilities since 1990 are down 50% in their CO2 emissions. Now, more importantly, I wanna put up, um, if you look at the 2002 peak in electric utilities, so that peak in the turquoise line, since 2002, we have seen an 83 percent decline. And so that is in large part to us uh, switching our energy fuel sources, our electric utility fuel sources toward renewable energy sources. So that is, that is a huge success. And those are the sorts of successes that we need to build on to be able to meet our goals. 
Okay, so in summary, I know that was a, a lot of data, um, but let me give you the highlights here. So in summary, gross emissions in 2017 were 17.5 below 1990 level, 17.5% 17 below 1990 level. So we are on target for our 2020 goal, right? Because our 2020 goal is to be 10% below 1990 level. So as long as we can keep on this track, we're gonna be good to meet our 2020 goal. Now, 90% of those emissions are the result of energy consumption. We use a lot of energy. We demand it. Um, and that is mostly from combustion of petroleum products. 54% of main CO2 emissions in 2017 were from the transportation sector, with residential being a close second, right, at 19%. CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion in the electric power sector have decreased by 83% since they peaked in 2002. So there are successes here. And the transportation and residential sectors have both the highest consumption of petroleum and the highest emissions of CO2 from burning fossil fuels. So those are just the highlights. Um, again, let me just remind you of our goals, right? So we're, we've met our 2010 goal. We're on track for our 2020 goal. Things look really good. But our 2030 goal and our 2050 goal, those are going to be harder. You know, so if we can realize the emission redu reductions that we've seen since 2002, then we're on track. But to realize those emissions, we are going to have to make some changes, right? So we have kind of already taken advantage of the easy wins, the, the switching from higher carbon fuels to lower carbon fuels. We've already done that. So we need to find some new innovative things to do to cut our greenhouse gas emissions. So that's why the governor formed the Climate Council um, to figure out how we're going to do this, right? To get the right people in the room talking to each other and figuring out a plan. Um, now, you probably know the Climate Council has been working very hard for the last six months or so. The different working groups have been meeting together to come up with proposed strategies. So ways they think in their area we can get the, the biggest bang for a buck in terms of greenhouse gas reductions. Um, and they just presented these findings uh, last month. So I know that that meeting is available online. You can go ahead and actually there's two meetings. They split it up into two days. So you can go online and you can watch those presentations. Um, everything from the Climate Council, by the way, is, is recorded and available online for you to watch after the fact. But um, what I want to talk to you about here is that the main Climate Council is really trying to get stakeholders involved. They want as much public participation as possible. And unfortunately, due to COVID-19, they've had to cancel a lot of the public stakeholder meetings that were planned um, just because it wasn't safe. So they're trying to find ways to engage the public, more ways to get more people involved, as many people as involved as possible. So you can see here, they have a website, climatecouncil.maine.gov, and there are a number of different ways that you can get involved. OK, um, I, I urge you to go to this website and take a look. If you have even the slightest little bit of interest, go in and take a look. There are a number of ways that you can get involved that you know, range from very little um, energy to more participation. Um, and for this group, I'd specifically like to point out the option to invite the Climate Council to present to your group. So you can do that. You can say, hey, I've got a group of stakeholders that are really interested in learning more. Can someone come and present to us? And they can make that happen. So this series seems to be a perfect fit for a presentation like that. Um, and I'm happy to get the ball rolling if that would be helpful. Reach out to my contacts at the Climate Council and see what we can do about setting up a presentation. Um, so think about it. Um, here is my contact information. If anyone has any questions that we don't get to today, um, here's my email and my phone number. And feel free to reach out to me. I think that's all I've got. Great. Well, thank you so much, Stacy, and thank you mm -hmm. so much, Sean. Um, I think before we get to a couple questions, maybe I'll I'll just say you know particular thank uh, thanks to you, Stacy, for um, pointing out uh, the telling folks a little bit more about the Maine Climate Council and showing folks um, opportunities that they can uh, engage in the Climate Council's work. Um, Maine Audubon is really excited about everything that's happening with the Climate Council. Um, I served on one of the working groups, the National Working Lands Working Group. Um, our Director of Conservation, Sally Stockwell, uh, is on the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee with Sean. Um, and we're, we're really invested as, in an, or, as an organization in implementing a, a successful, uh, actionable, Climate Action Plan. So I would really encourage folks to go to the website that Stacy just shared, and then also to um, stay in touch with Maine Audubon. Um, so we, it's our aim to bring additional attention to the um, 
to the various opportunities that will continue to arise to get people engaged with the Climate Council because this is going to work um, or is going to work best when people give as much input as possible. This is about making a climate action plan that works for all Maine people um, and that means that we need to, to socialize this plan and get um, as much input as possible. So please um, let uh, be sure to follow those links and stay in touch with uh, the great mailing list that the Climate Council has, that Maine Audubon has, uh, and, and stay tuned. Nick, what do you think? Shall we dive into some questions? How do you, how do you let's, should... let's dive in. We're, we're nearing the end of the hour, but I want to make sure we get to these questions. Um, uh, Sean and Stacey, do you have, if we go a little bit over, is that okay, or do you guys have to run? Oh, okay. that's fine with me. Let's dive in. We'll go quickly. Uh, Sean, a question for you. So what current state would Maine be equated to for a growing season by 2050, would you say? That's an excellent question. And I, I haven't had time to, to uh, find out precisely where that would be. But in general, I would, in, I would expect probably Massachusetts, Connecticut. Uh, with the caveat that uh, there's a pretty steep there's a very steep temperature gradient across the state, as we're all aware. So the climate of northern Maine is not the climate of southern Maine. And um, uh, there's also Maine's geographic position and northern New England in particular. Uh, it's impacted by, it's at a convergence of different air masses. And the dynamics of that is not the same as it is to our south. Um, and so even in a warming climate, for example, um, northern Maine will still have the greatest potential of getting, say, for example, air coming down from Canada, cool, dry air from Canada. And, um, and so, but it is useful to try to identify analogs. So long story short, Massachusetts, Connecticut, it also depends on the emissions trajectory and how much warming there is between now and 2050. Great, thank you. And I should say that was a question from Jamie, Jamie Willie. Uh, here's a question from Susan Parks uh, to you, Sean, again, she said, she's read that the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming oceans in the world. Is that true? And if so, why is that happening? Well, the, uh, let me give you some of the, the historical uh, context in terms of the Gulf of Maine warming. The, uh, the Gulf of Maine has, it, it warmed, significantly between about 2004 and, excuse me, between about 2004 and 2012. And during that interval, the warming was faster, at a rate faster than any other part of, of the ocean. Um, and that's on an annual mean. Over the past several years, so the annual mean temperature has leveled off. Uh, but uh, there's expectation that the Gulf Maine will continue to warm. And so, um, uh, so yes, during that particularly steep rise in temperature, it was the fastest warming ocean body in the world. But there is variability that uh, will likely impact the, the future trajectory. So there may be some cool years, or relatively speaking, but the overall trend will be upward. Um, and so why the Gulf of Maine is warming, it links to um, both oceanic circulation and also atmospheric circulation. And as an example, uh, 2012, the first really big marine heat wave is what they're now called, occurred in 2012 um, at the peak of this uh, several years of a, of a really extreme warming. Uh, there was both- uh -oh, Can folks still hear me? Uh, I, I can hear you. Um, can anybody hear me out there? It sounds like we might have froze up a little bit. No, no. Well, the um, the circulation entering the Gulf of Maine it's a it's a complex story of of ocean water coming up um, coming off the Gulf Stream in eddies that mix in the basin, but also uh, cold water water that comes down the Arctic um, and then flows along the coast of Nova Scotia and enters the Gulf, and so that's a, a cold. Uh, low salinity water source versus a much warmer, higher salinity source. But there's a battle between these two different types of water masses. And uh, there's also atmospheric circulation that provides the wind stress 
that that can propel an ocean current one way or, or the next. So it, it's a complex picture. Uh, but the warming in the Gulf of Maine has largely reflected the warming in the larger scale North Atlantic region. And so as the North Atlantic warms, the Gulf of Maine is also um, expected to warm as well. And um, now it, uh, whether it warms at a uh, particular rate, that's a, a question because again, it's, it's, it depends on, there could be a regime where a little bit more cold water flows into the Gulf that moderates temperatures for a while. Does that answer your question? Great. Yeah, thank you. And I, so I, I just lost power for a moment. Um, it looks like it didn't screw everything up, which is good, but I did lose the questions. Um, so I don't know, Eliza, if you have the questions, those are all gone. So maybe you could take over asking. Yeah, happily. Uh, and the, the worst happened, but I guess it wasn't that bad. So right on, Nick, for uh, prepping us for what a power outage uh, in Zoom land is like. Uh, let's see. Um, it's a question for Stacy from David. Um, he asks that uh, folks sometimes overlook the importance of energy efficiency in reducing emissions um, and asks if you could break down um, the role that energy efficiency has played in uh, reducing emissions to date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I don't have specific data on this topic, um, but where we're going to see that, obviously this is a, a huge strategy and one that everybody can implement immediately. Um, obviously in the, the, the bigger sectors, this is something that the manufacturers and automakers will be working on increased efficiencies, but um, there are a lot of federal regulations related to this, like the vehicle cafe standards, those are all increased efficiency focused strategies. Um, where I see this in the greenhouse gas data in the SIT is in the reduction of fossil fuel use, right? A deduction of, well, all fuel use, really. So it, the primary database, the foundational database for the SIT, the state inventory tool that we use, is fuel consumption, right? It's fuel consumption data in BTU. That's the British thermal unit. So that's the amount of energy required to raise one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So it's um, kind of an effectiveness number. Um, and so with increased efficiencies, we are going to see those numbers reduced because people will be using less fuel. So while we might not be able to pinpoint other than with, with fancy models um, that kind of guess at where different strategies are affecting our fuel use, um, we will see that overall fuel reduction with energy efficiency strategies. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the specifics. Um, there are a lot of models out there that look at um, various strategies and the expected impact on fuel consumption, um, but none of that is incorporated into the greenhouse gas report at this time. Thanks, Stacey. So I'm gonna do two, two more questions. Um, the first one being, um, and anyone jump in, uh, this is from Jeff. He asks uh, about wood burning compared to fossil fuel um, and emissions and kind of what's, heat provided between um, uh, uh, fossil fuels and uh, burning wood? Was he a plant? <laughs> because this is, this is what my day-to-day -day work is looking like right now. Wood is a primary focus. Um, so as you may have noticed in the current greenhouse gas report in the eighth biennial report, there are no renewables mentioned. So in the back, if you get a chance, I encourage all of you to grab a copy of the greenhouse gas report. It is on the, the DEP website. And in the back, you will see a number of tables and it will show you the consumption of energy by different sources. And that does include a breakdown of the renewable sources that we use for energy. Obviously there are no emissions from some renewable sources. Um, other renewable sources do have emissions like wood. Um, but with this eighth biennial report, as well as all of the previous greenhouse gas reports, we have sort of ignored the emissions from wood because we are assumed that they are balanced by the sequestration of our growing forests. Um, and in Maine, that's, that's a fairly valid assumption um, for the most part. Uh, now, with the governor's promise for carbon neutrality, we need to start looking at those numbers specifically. We can't just make an assumption that renewables are balanced by the sequestration. We need to quantify that. So what you will see in the next greenhouse gas report, which will be released in January 2022, but we're already working on now, um, you will see emissions from wood 
and you're going to see emissions from all of the renewables that produce emissions, things like ethanol and, and wood are the big two. Um, so we don't have all of those data sorted out yet. Um, I would say that there are a lot of emissions from wood. It's, it's right up there with some of the fossil fuels, it is. But you also have a sequestration of the greenhouse gases. So you have to make up your own opinion of what is better or worse, um, but there are emissions from wood burning. It is not 100% neutral. Um, and so for the next greenhouse gas report, we will report on that. And so what you will see are gross emissions with and without renewables. For the first report, we're gonna do it both ways. So you can see the difference. Um, and then we're working with University of Maine to come up with that sequestration piece. Um, so they are coming up with, it's not a time series of sequestration, but they are trying to figure out where we are in terms of our carbon neutrality goal. And so their piece includes the gross emissions that we report on, as well as all of the different sinks, all of the different sources and sinks of carbon in our environment to try to figure out where we are. And so their piece will include the sequestration from the forest. And you can then kind of balance and see where we are in terms of emissions from wood, and it will be reported separately. So it's not just lumped into gross emissions. You will see the emissions specifically from wood over time since 1990, um, as well as by sector. So you'll see emissions from wood in residential, in transportation, in industrial, commercial, et cetera. And then you can kind of balance that with the sequestration um, that the UMAIN team has found. I hope that's helpful. It is, thank you, Stacy. And, um, and I think, you know, as you've referenced a number of upcoming reports and there's um, been some great sharing of, um, well, actually maybe no, this has not been seen by the uh, by audience members or participants, but there's a lot of great resources out there. And I know we'll be doing a follow-up email that will um, point folks to uh, many of the uh, resources that both Sean and Stacy have mentioned um, so that folks can dive into this even more. Um, and I'll, I'll finally take a question from Jocelyn, who asks about um, solutions that are being proposed to decrease um, transportation emissions. Um, and I'll punt that to say that um, that will be the topic of an upcoming um, uh, uh, talk within this series um, that we'll be talking, uh, diving even more into uh, transportation emissions and some of the policy solutions that have been proposed um, for reducing those emissions, you know, as Stacy um, showed very clearly uh, in the the graphs that uh, Stacy shared, transportation um, is a, in our biggest source of emissions, and is also um, perhaps our most uh, challenging problem, if that's what you want to call it, to to fix. Um, and so uh, that is something that you know, to be actually perfectly honest, as we were putting together this uh, climate series transportation was kind of number one in um, something that we wanted, content we wanted to deliver to uh, folks out there. Transportation is not an area of expertise for Maine Audubon, but we do know that it is essential to, um, an essential component of our, what's gonna be our uh, updated climate action plan. So it was really important for us to deliver more information um, to folks on that topic. So, so stay tuned with that. Um, and I will push it over to Nick for, uh, for final thoughts and to wrap us up. Um, I, the only final thoughts is that this was great. I'm so glad that nothing collapsed uh, under the storm. Um, I just put a link in the chat to where folks can register um, for the upcoming climate talks uh, in two weeks from today. Uh, we have a talk about uh, community solar and how folks can get involved. And then following that uh, with about rooftop solar. So uh, really great practical information for folks who are looking to cut down on their own carbon footprint. Um, and so I just really wanted to thank uh, Sean and Stacy for joining us today. This was absolutely fantastic and a perfect way to um, get started on this series. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Laura Craver Rogers for putting so many great links in the chat. She was really on top of things. Um, so thanks to all. Um, I will be stopping this recording and putting it on Maine Audubon's website uh, as soon as I can. So stay tuned for that and keep an eye out for the email um, that Eliza mentioned. And thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you.